SRB hydraulic power units have started. T minus 21 seconds, and the solid uh, rocket booster engine gimbal now underway. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Hydraulic power units have started. T minus 21 seconds, and the solid uh, rocket booster engine gimbal now underway. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. J. McDonald, and I am currently an aerospace consultant and author of a book called Truth, Lies, and O-Rings Inside the Space Shuttle Challenger Disaster. At the time of the Challenger disaster, I was the director of the Space Shuttle Solid Rocket Motor Project for Morton Thiokol, the manufacturers of the uh, large solid rocket boosters on the shuttle. I'm going to discuss the Challenger accident, how it, the launch evolved, what happened to the Challenger during its launch and some of the uh, inquisition that happened as a result of the investigation by a presidential commission on the accident. The Challenger disaster happened on the morning of January 28, 1986. It took place at, uh, on pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I received a telephone call from a fellow that worked for me. And he said, Al, he says, we were just told that there was a uh, weather forecaster, I believe in Orlando, that was forecasting uh, a cold front in, in the area of Florida that might drop temperatures as low as 18 degrees Fahrenheit by tomorrow morning. And uh, we're really concerned about whether the O-ring seals and these field joints of the solid rocket booster will operate at those temperatures properly. And I said, well, I'm very concerned about that too. Uh, they said, Al, what you need to do for us is, is get a hold of somebody at the Cape there from NASA to find out what they're projecting hour by hour all through the night at the launch site, not in Orlando, so that we can calculate what the actual temperature will be on various parts of, of our boosters by the opening of the launch window. I says, I will get that information and call it back to you. But I said, when you get it, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get the engineers together and have them make an assessment of their concerns of the cold temperatures on the ceiling of those O-ring seals. And I would like them to make a recommendation as what is the lowest, safest temperature to launch that we can tolerate. And I want that decision and recommendation to be made by the Vice President of Engineering, not program management. 
I felt that that was a thorny technical issue and should be decided on its technical merits only. And as a result, I requested that the Vice President of Engineering make that recommendation. So I called the NASA rep there and arranged for that teleconference that evening. And it was a three-way teleconference between the engineers in Utah, those in, of NASA in Alabama, and our management at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. So it was not surprising to me that after the engineers presented their information, the Vice President of Engineering came on just as I requested and recommended that they do not launch the Challenger below 53 degrees Fahrenheit, which was primarily based on that observation of that flight a year earlier. The NASA management really didn't accept that conclusion and felt that if we're going to change the launch cri commit criteria, we needed to anchor it in something better than just this qualitative obser observation. And here was a condition which we had claimed as in our opinion, going in a direction that may well cause a failure, a very catastrophic failure. And so what happened is that my boss, uh, Mr. Joel Kilminster, who was the Vice President of Space Booster Programs, came on the telecon and asked for uh, a fi five-minute off-line caucus to make sure that we had presented everything that we had available to us and see if we could better uh, uh, analyze the joint to determine if there was a lower temperature that was safe to launch. What really surprised me was that when the management of my company came back on a half hour later on the teleconference, it wasn't the Vice President of Engineering anymore who made the recommendation not to launch below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. It was my boss, the Vice President of Space Booster Programs, Head of Program Management. And he said that they had reassessed all of their data and they have concluded that it's okay to proceed with the launch as planned. No restrictions at all, no temperature uh, requirement whatsoever. Well, NASA's reaction was is that, uh, well, they accepted that without any question, but they needed that recommendation put in writing and signed by a responsible thiokol official. Well, I knew who that responsible thiokol official was. That was me. That's why I was there. And I made the smartest decision I ever made in my lifetime. I refused to sign it. Now, I didn't think it was un totally unethical that the NASA people questioned how we arrived at that decision and the data we presented. What was unethical is they knew that we had a moral obligation to always prove it was safe. And what they had just done was put the engineering people in a position to prove that it would fail. That's a totally different question. You're never supposed to do that. And in fact, the final decision, which I didn't know at the time, I found out later, was that the uh, general manager uh, uh, decided not to listen to the engineers who still felt that it was too risky and tried to convince him not to change the decision even though he thought that NASA had some good questions and he kind of agreed with them, uh, he decided that he was going to poll his management team, which ended up as only the vice president, as to whether we should launch or not. Now, this was, at the time, all unknown to me because I was uh, back at the Cape. But I was so disturbed with the change in the launch recommendation and we were waiting for the written recommendation to come back from our plant in Utah, that I turned to the NASA management people and I said, you know, I said, uh, I really don't feel comfortable with that decision. I don't agree with it. But more importantly, you cannot even accept that recommendation. And they says, what do you mean, Al? I said, you cannot accept it because you know and I know that you're asking us to fly those solid rocket motors outside a temperature it's been qualified to fly in. And you can't do that. You can't fly any of the shuttle hardware outside of its qualification limits. That's against protocol, so you can't accept it. I'm recommending launching, not based on what I know, but what I do not know, and you're in exactly the same position. And they said, Al, you know, these shouldn't be your concerns, but we'll pass them on 
into a, in an advisory capacity only. And they said, where is this fax that's signed uh, by your official? And it so happened the fax machine was the other end of the building, so I went down there, and uh, it took, took a while to come in, but I finally brought it back. And when I brought it back, they were in a teleconference with one of the people on the mission management team. Since I was gone for 15, 20 minutes, I presume they talked about the O-ring issue earlier, and uh, I was shocked to find out later they never mentioned it. Well, I uh, remember getting up early that morning of the launch, and I was carrying my briefcase in one hand and my headset in the other going to Launch Control Center. And I remember hearing on the radio it was 22 degrees Fahrenheit at the time. I went into the Launch Control Center and sat down at a console that I'm <coughs> supposed to be at to monitor all the data on the solid rocket boosters. And uh, in uh, the corner of that uh, TV, uh, monitor that I have, they have uh, access to various cameras that are on the vehicle that you can punch in and look at. I remember I started looking at some of the cameras and I noticed there was ice uh, hanging on the vehicle, there was ice uh, hanging on platforms next to it, and I quickly concluded myself, well, they aren't going to launch this thing today. And the next thing I uh, noticed was uh, several minutes later, they decided to send an ice team out to the uh, launch platform to knock down as much of the ice they possibly could and take it off the mobile launch platform because they're concerned of, of debris. Uh, and they did that. And after they did that, they picked up the count again, and uh, they finally made another stop in the count to go back and send the ice team again to relook re at the launch pad, and they did. Came back and concluded that it was okay to proceed with the launch, which really surprised me, but they did. Now, I really expected if the O-rings would fail because of cold temperature, they would do it right at ignition when you would light these solid rocket boosters. Strangely enough, some 73 seconds later, the whole vehicle looked like it had exploded in the air. And I was watching it on the TV camera with one eye on the so pressure traces of solid rocket boosters and the data we were monitoring and it was absolutely shocking to everyone that was in their control room. Uh, I could hear some people actually sobbing in the background because they knew that this was unsurvivable. I went to uh, Huntsville, Alabama, the Mass and Marshall Space Flight Center next morning to be part of the failure analysis team that NASA was forming on the solid rockets. And I was about convinced that, yeah, this was caused by in my opinion, I thought it probably was a cracked turbine blade and the space shuttle main engines finally came loose because they were having that problem and went through the tank and that caused the explosion or the tank structurally came apart and exploded. And I was ready to leave and go home because I've been gone for about a week and I actually walked out the door and was heading out the door and this fellow from NASA that I argued with the night before by the name of Larry Malloy said, Al, you need to get back in here. He says, why? He says, well, you've got Jim Kingsbury, the director of science and engineering for Marshall, that's at the Cape looking at some movies and films of the launch. And he claims he can see some fire coming out of the side of one of your solid rocket boosters just before the explosion. My heart sank when I saw the actual launch film because I thought, you know, it probably did happen exactly for the reason we were concerned the night before the launch. The O-rings were too cold. And it wasn't until President Reagan decided to form a presidential commission where the real answers came out, and primarily from me, not NASA. What had happened is I stayed and worked on that failure team, and within a few days, I presented to NASA exactly how the Challenger failed, and it was due to the cold old ring issue that we had addressed the night before. It just manifested itself in a final failure quite different than we expected. 
but that's why it really failed. It was clear that they didn't want to hear that. And what had happened was uh, one of the NASA people in Washington, who was a budget analyst, had sent a memo he had written to the New York Times. And it was about this problem that we had with this O-rings and the joints. Well, at that time, NASA had never briefed the President Commission on, what, on anything what had caused the accident at all. They knew nothing about any. And yet, it was almost a week earlier, I'd briefed them exactly what caused it. So they scheduled a closed hearing that afternoon with NASA. Well, NASA wanted all my charts that I had given to headquarters the previous summer, and I gave it to them. And I remember going up to this briefing, and it was in the old executive office building next to the White House. And uh, the NASA folks made it very clear they were going to give the entire briefing. Uh, no one else need to make any comments unless they were specifically requested to do so. And the fellow was briefing was a fellow I argued with, and he was going through these charts, and he briefed for about an hour and a half. And the commission asked for a break. They took a break. They came back, and I remember uh, Dr. Sally Ride, before she sat down, she was thumbing through a bunch of pink telephone slips. She says, before we get back to the briefing, because the guy was going to read, I'd like to uh, ask you a question. I, re I returned a few of my phone calls. And one of them was some reporter here in Washington that asked me if it was really true. They'd heard a rumor that one of the contractors may have been concerned about the cold temperatures affecting their hardware. May have even recommended not launching. Is that really true? In fact, he said, we had a teleconference about their concerns of the projected temperatures on the field joints and O-rings. Uh, and as a result of that teleconference, we had all our engineers in communication with all our engineers in Alabama and the management Kennedy and reviewed all that. And as a result of that conference, uh, uh, Martin Thiokol recommended that we proceed on with the launch as planned, and they submitted a, a written statement to that effect and went back to his briefing. And I thought, well, I guess that's a true statement, but that is about misleading as anything I ever saw and was certainly unethical. And so I finally started walking down the stairs towards the conference table that the commissioners were sitting at. And Mr. Larry Malloy was given this briefing, was giving one of the charts that I'd given him, in fact, that morning. He was being asked some questions about it. He said, I think Al McDonald has something to add here. I said, I think this commission should know that Martin Thackall was so concerned about the projected cold temperatures on our field joints and O-rings that we recommended not launching below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. I remember Chairman William Rogers, who was the head of the Presidential Commission, and his vice chairman, who was Neil Armstrong, and Dr. Richard Feynman. They all kind of stood up and trying to peek at who this guy was coming down here. And, and William Rogers was the ex-Secretary of State under Nixon and Attorney General under Eisenhower. And he looked at me and he says, well, who in the hell are you? He said, would you please come down here on the floor and repeat? what I think I heard, because if I heard what I think I heard, this will be in litigation for years to come. My life changed when he said that because I knew who was going to be in the middle of all of this litigation for years to come, me. Looking back at all the decisions and things that happened, there's two criteria I always look at with regard to ethics. There's ethics that are associated with having to make tough decisions, tough pressure, time constraints in that environment, and then there's those that aren't, which I consider those, frankly, are the worst ethical issues. And both of those occurred in the Challenger decision. I'm proud of what I did, but as far as ethics was concerned, the biggest breach of ethics was the fact that both my company and NASA attempted to cover up what really happened that night before the launch. And there was obf obfuscation by NASA on what really caused the final accident, which I went over with the Presidential Commission before they filed the report, and they agreed with me. And to me, that was a bigger error 
than the pressure at the time to launch from a breach of ethics because they had time to think about it and deceive people. One of the big disappointments I had after going through all that and uh, uh, a lot of the lessons that were learned from Challenger in, were fairly well implemented immediately after, but they carried over to a point where they finally were forgotten some 17 years later. When they launched the Columbia that year in 2003, they clearly saw on the film this huge piece of foam, it was called ramp foam off the tank, impact the orbiter. And it actually impacted the leading edge rather than under the tile and shattered. Uh, they then ran some analysis of what that impact damage could be and they had the fanciest, uh, most up-to-date computer model there was available at that time in 2003 and concluded that the damage wasn't significant enough that they couldn't uh, return home safely. There were some engineers at Langley that didn't feel comfortable that that was the case and said, well, we can find out for sure by asking the Department of Defense to turn one of their spy satellites towards the orbiter in orbit facing towards it and it will see it in spades if it has significant damage that it would be a catastrophic reentry. So they made a specific request to the mission management team to do that. And it so happened that the mission management team declined that request on the basis that they'd had an analysis done by Boeing on this a crater model computer program that was the most fancy thing in the world and that they don't feel that it was adequate damage so they didn't need to go through the protocol and all to make a request to, to make these pictures. It was the first time in the 50-year history of NASA that I saw they, they went from a can-do attitude to a can't-do and that was the most serious mistake, the most unethical mistake I think they probably made in their entire history. One of the lessons learned I tell students also is this, don't always believe in all your big computer programs. Use your gut feeling and some back of the envelope test of reasonableness checks on some of those answers because that will give you far more confidence. And I tell you, some people have better judgment just saying, you know, it doesn't smell right. And, and you need to do that. And so that's the other lesson learned. And, and don't presume anything. If you think it's important, make sure that what you thought was important got to the right people. So that's what I wished I would have done.